uh, it's time for one of my favorite chapters of the whole year in Earth Space Science. It's chapter 24, Beyond Our Solar System. Uh, we get to talk about everything else in the universe, uh, all the other types of galaxies. We get to talk about stars, how they're born, how they live their lives, how they die. We get to talk about the universe itself. We get to talk about how, in fact, the universe uh, began and what's happening to it and how it's expanding and how, how, in fact, we know that. So there's just some really big and awesome topics to talk about. So without any further delay, uh, let's get going. As you know from last time, you're basically going to watch this YouTube video and pause it as you need to to copy down the information that I circle. It's only necessary to type in and copy down the information that I actually circle uh, in your document when you submit it in Canvas. What is the universe? So. About 100 years ago, this famous astronomer named Edwin Hubble tried to figure out what these fuzzy blobs were in the sky. Were they pretty close by, just like the planets and the other stars in our own galaxy, or were they much, much farther away? As it turns out, he studied these stars called Cepheid variables, which, uh, which, as it turns out, vary in brightness. Uh, if you know how fast they vary in brightness, you can figure out how bright they are. All, uh, the other information you need to know is that when a star is farther away, it looks dimmer. So by putting those two concepts together, he realized that though there, there were Cepheid variables in these fuzzy patches and that these fuzzy patches had to be millions or even billions of light years away. He determined for the first time that those fuzzy patches were other blobs of stars, other groups of billions of stars, just like our own Milky Way galaxy. Large telescopes can actually look back in time. Why? because the universe is so big and it takes so long for light from those other galaxies to get here. A galaxy that is a billion light years away, if we look, take a look at that with a telescope, we're seeing it a billion light years in the past, excuse me, a billion years in the past, because it took a billion years for light to get here. We'll talk about the Big Bang Theory as well uh, in a little bit more detail. It's the concept that space, matter, time, and energy all began from a single point about 14 billion years ago, and that the universe has been expanding ever since. Talked about a light year already. There is uh, the definition of a light year on this screen. We'll talk about nebulas as well. Uh, these are called stellar nurseries for the simple reason that stars are born in nebulas. There are clouds and areas of gas and dust. If you remember from a couple chapters ago, our own star, the sun, and the solar system formed as a cloud of gas and dust that began to rotate. Here's a beautiful picture of a reflection nebula. You can see that there's light from these blue stars that's being reflected off the gases and the dust in this area of space. Those blue stars are actually much hotter than our own star and much brighter. We'll learn about that in a second. There's three types of a nebula. Emission nebula, where the gas glows because it's hot. Reflection nebula, light from a nearby star. There's an emission nebula. And also dark nebulas. Dark nebulas are called dark because they are literally dark in the sense that the gas and dust is so dense that the light can't get through them. So the areas in space that look dark, particularly in our own galaxy, it's not because there's no stars there, it's just because light can't get through the dust. One other type of nebula is called a planetary nebula. This is kind of a misnomer. Uh, scientists used to think that these were maybe the beginnings of a solar system forming. We now know that, that actually this is a star that has sort of exploded, for lack of a better word, better word. Its outer layers have been shut off into space. Uh, this is probably what's going to happen to the sun in about 5 billion years. So if we're still around at that time, it's not going to be pretty. Let's move on to the Hertzsprung-Russell, or HR diagram for short. Uh, many decades ago, astronomers started graphing a star's brightness versus temperature. We're going to take a look at the HR diagram in a second, and we're going to learn that there's uh, three different, four different parts to it. Main sequence stars, where 90% of the stars are located and where the sun is located. There are giant stars, or otherwise it's called red giants. They're very bright, very large, but also very cool because they're reddish in color. Red is the cool color in physics, and blue is the hot color. Three, we also have white dwarfs. They're fainter and smaller. They're stars that are only about the size of Earth, even though they have as much mass as the sun. So you know that they must be incredibly dense. Here is the HR diagram. You can see that most stars fall along the main sequence, most stars including the sun. However, when stars begin to die, they expand. That makes them brighter and cooler. That's why they show up toward the top of the chart and also toward the left. Taking a look at the HR diagram lets us understand stellar evolution. 
So there's two opposing forces in a star. Gravity is trying to crush the star, the gravity of all that matter being in one place, and also the energy that's being released is trying to expand it. At some points in the star's history, one versus the other uh, can win. When stars are born in a dark nebula, gravity contracts. Uh, as you know, when you compress a gas, the temperature goes up. And when the temperature of that gas reaches about 10 million Kelvin, Nuclear fusion happens. This also happens in nuclear fusion bombs or H-bombs, but this fusion releases energy and then for the first time the star starts to glow with its own energy. The star then becomes a main sequence star. The interesting thing about those is the very massive stars, stars that are 5, 10, even 50 times the mass of our own star, uh, sun, they don't last very long. They die in only a few, few million years, but stars that are smaller than our sun can last much longer than our star. Why? Main reason is because those bigger stars burn their fuel faster. Either way, 90% of a star's lifetime is in the main sequence. When a star begins to run out of hydrogen in its core, it enters the red giant stage. That causes the star to expand, which cools the star. It makes it redder. Eventually, all that fuels up and gravity crushes and squeezes the star. There are several different possibilities here that can happen, and we'll take a look at them next. Sorry, with a, a low mass star, uh, we, it simply becomes a red giant and collapses to a white dwarf. With a medium mass star like our own sun, uh, the red giant collapses and then its outer layers blow off into that planetary nebula we took a look at a few slides, a few slides ago. And then it too becomes a white dwarf. Finally, with the most massive stars, uh, during that collapse uh, at the end, there's actually enough pressure and temperature inside the core to crush all of the atoms of hydrogen and helium of that star into all the other elements on the periodic table up to uranium and thorium. This creates all those other heavy elements in the universe, and it does so in a matter of seconds. So much energy is released that the star explodes in what's called a supernova. Again, this will not happen to our star, uh, the sun. However, this is what caused every element past hydrogen and helium on the periodic table. All those other elements that our body's made of, carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, iron, the iron in our blood was formed in a supernova when a massive star died and exploded uh, billions of years ago. This is a good graphic to help you remember the, the three different things that can happen to stars, whether they're small, low mass stars, whether they're medium mass like our sun, or whether they're high mass stars. Now, what about those things that are left after a star uh, has ended its life? What, white dwarfs, uh, what are they like? Well, they're small, as we said. They're small, and in some sense, they're no larger than Earth. But remember, they have the entire mass of a star crushed down into that space. So they must be very dense. A spoonful of it might weigh as much as your car. When larger stars die, however, uh, something really strange happens. You probably remember from chemistry or ICP that atoms are made of protons and neutrons in the nucleus and electrons uh, in, the, uh, in the energy levels. However, these neutron stars are actually so dense, gravity crushes them so much, the electrons get shoved into the nucleus. They actually join with protons to become other neutrons. You get this giant ball of neutrons in space. A piece of a neutron star that might be the size of a pea could weigh hundreds of millions of tons. When, neutrons rotate, when neutron stars rotate, they can create pulsars, which were once mistaken for extraterrestrial radio signals. This is a great picture of a supernova remnant that created the Crab Nebula. This was a massive star that blew up many years ago and spread heavy elements out into space to make a new nebula. It's a rotating neutron star that we can detect uh, with radio receivers on Earth. And now for the most mysterious thing, black holes. When stars are more massive than even a neutron star, we don't know of any known force that can stop the star from, from collapsing down to a single point. In fact, the gravity is so strong that light cannot even escape, and that's why it's called a black hole. However, even though we, uh, we can't directly see them in most cases, we do know they're there because as stuff falls into a black hole, it accelerates to near the speed of light, becomes very hot, and the atoms that are falling in tend to get ripped apart. This actually emits x-rays, and so we can see them. We can also detect stars orbiting 
these points in space. We see a star orbiting and moving in some elliptical pattern. However, we don't see another star there. We kind of know that there has to be a black hole there. If you take a look at some of the other YouTube videos that I shared in Canvas, you can see a video of uh, what that looks like. So I encourage you to take a look at one of those. Next topic, galaxies. Our galaxy, the Milky Way, has 50 to 100 billion stars in it. But amazingly, there's also at least 50 billion other galaxies like the Milky Way out there. The numbers are just mind boggling. We do know that galaxies come in several flavors. The first type is spiral galaxies. About 30% of all galaxies, including our Milky Way, are spiral. I've circled some areas in this picture to show you the dark areas. These are dark nebula, areas where there's dense gas and dust where new stars could be forming. A great picture of a spiral galaxy. Again, if we could fly far away from our own galaxy and look down on it, this is what we would see. 50 billion stars right there. By the way, all those other stars around it are just stars that got in the way. There's stars a lot closer that just got in the way of the picture. Uh, that, ga that galaxy is much farther away than those other stars, which are in our own Milky Way. Another type of galaxy is called an elliptical. Actually, uh, about 60% of all galaxies are elliptical. And finally, there's a few that just don't fit, a, fit any pattern. They're irregular. About 10% of all galaxies are irregular. There's even groups of galaxies. There's actually at least 28 galaxies in our own group, the local group. And we know that there's actually clusters of thousands and even millions of galaxies that are held together by their own respective gravities. I've circled uh, every galaxy that I could find in this picture in the Fornax Galaxy Cluster. Next, the biggest thing we could possibly study in all of science is the universe itself. And so how did the universe start? To answer that question, let's, let's do a quick review of the Doppler effect. If you remember from the last chapter, as an object is moving away from us, the wavelengths of light get stretched out. The wavelength increases, the light gets redder. This means that an object is moving away from us. The more the light is stretched out, the faster it's moving away. In fact, as we look at these distant galaxies, the farther they are away, the more the light is stretched out. Most galaxies exhibit a Doppler shift and most exhibit a red shift, as you can see here. That means most are moving away. The farthest away galaxies have the greatest shift. What does this mean? Well, what this means is that the, the universe is expanding. And this led Edwin Hubble to come up with his famous Hubble's Law. The moving away speed of galaxies is proportional to their distance. That means if a galaxy is twice as far away from us, it's moving away from us twice as fast. We believe that 13.7 that billion years ago, the universe began expanding. How do we come up with that crazy number? Well, all we have to do is do a simple speed equals distance over time problem. By measuring the redshift, we can measure the speed that all the galaxies are spreading apart. Uh, once we know that speed and we measure the distance, we can simply solve for the time. And astronomers have calculated that time to be 13.7 billion years ago. Well, uh, we now know uh, by closely studying uh, what's happening with these galaxies that are all moving away from us that the universe seems to be lasting forever. In fact, the universe is expanding. It's not slowing down. In fact, What's ha what we do see is as that, I, that little poorly drawn graph on the bottom is the speed is actually increasing. As time goes by, galaxies are spreading apart faster. This was mind boggling and astronomers couldn't really explain why that was happening. If anything, it should be slowing down because the gravity of all the galaxies should be trying to stop it. And so we have some really strange stuff now to talk about. We're kind of, we've reached the edge of science, I hate to say. Uh, what, uh, what are some things out there that astronomers are still trying to figure out? Well, dark matter. Uh, one thing that we realize about our Milky Way galaxy is that it's rotating too fast. In fact, if it was rotating this fast, it should be tearing itself apart. Things should be, stars should be flying out of the galaxy. But there seems to be this extra gravity that's there that's somehow giving that extra amount of gravity and force to hold our galaxy together. We don't know what it is, but we know it has gravity, so we made up a name for it. Astronomers called it dark matter. Dark energy is even more mysterious. It was, uh, it, that term was coined after we realized that the universe was speeding up faster as time goes by. 
The only way to make that to happen would be as if there is some extra energy being added to the universe, much like by heating up a balloon, you can cause the gas to expand. We, there, it's almost as if somebody's taking the universe and holding it over a, a burner on a stove and turning up the heat as the years go by, making the ex acceleration go faster. We can't explain it. We don't know why it's happening, but we call it dark energy. And that's the end of science. Uh, again, uh, go back and review these if you need to. Copy those down into a Google Doc and submit that in Canvas. Good luck. Take care.